Okay, so we have deduced in a previous lecture from the uh, least action principle the validity of a Lagrangian uh, balance equation, which is the Euler Lagrange condition uh, implied by the condition of minimization of action. Then, via a Piola transport, we have deduced this equation, which modulo some uh, meaningless details in notations you should know already because here you have the density of the fluid, the material derivative of the fluid, the gradient of the pressure and the bulk forces. Okay. What uh, has to be underlined which is important for the continuation is the following. When you give a deformation energy for your body, not all externally applied actions can be sustained by the body you are studying. So if you have a Cauchy continuum or an Euler fluid and you apply a force concentrated in one point, you are in trouble because that force, externally applied force, cannot be sustained by the continuum you are, you are introducing, which means if you have an external action whose area of application is small enough compared with the characteristic length which you are introducing in modeling the Cauchy continuum, then the Cauchy continuum is not a sufficient model for describing the deformation of your body under the applied forces. This reasoning cannot be understood if you don't distinguish between the model and the real body. So you have a real body, you apply to this real body an, an external for, force in a, on the boundary, for instance, on an area which is very, very small. When you try to apply Cauchy continuum theory to this situation, it fails. So, in other words, when you fix, <coughs> when you fix your model, you have only a class of external actions which can be applied to this body, this model of a body. Okay, so once you fix the model, you are fixing uni in a unique way the kind of external actions which you can model with this mathematical model. Okay, for instance, if you have an Euler fluid, in an Euler fluid, external contact actions are only parallel to the normal. You cannot have shear forces. This does not mean that the world is illogical. So, very often, uh, students interpret this statement as follows. In reality, you cannot apply shear forces to fluids, which is false. I already mentioned you have D'Alembert paradox, which tells that the total force applied to a body which is 
surrounded by an Euler fluid is zero. This paradox implies that there is nothing which is able to fly. So if you behave like middle age philosopher, you will say that reality is not logical. If instead you assume a truly uh, modern or ancient way, Hellenistic way of considering science, you conclude that your mathematical model is not capable to describe that phenomenon. So Euler equations, Euler fluids, neglecting viscosities, have a stress tensor which is purely diagonal, spherical, you have only a pressure, okay? So you cannot apply Euler model for describing the interaction between air and the wing of an airplane. Okay, so you have to improve your model. So we can say that the assumption about the internal deformation energy determines the capability of considered body to sustain externally applied actions. Even if this is correct, it is not philosophically correct, because here I am confusing the physical object body and the mathematical object body in this way causing some possible misunderstandings, okay? This is crucial if we want to understand second gradient continua. We will discover that second gradient fluids can sustain shear forces in static conditions. So they are an improved version of Euler fluids, however not of the same sort as Navier Stokes fluid. Because when nothing moves, a Navier fluid reduces to Euler fluid. Okay? Now, you can see, uh, one should find them, maybe I will add to the documents which are accompanying these lectures, you can see beautiful pictures of small insects walking on the boundary layer between water and vapor of water. So it is clear that uh, these uh, fluids can exert shear forces, maybe tiny shear forces. So there are phenomena in which you have a stationary fluid without any velocity in which shear forces are exerted on the fluid and the fluid stays in equilibrium. Okay, so there are important phenomena in which externally applied forces on a fluid include shear forces. So this is a first direct, but there is also a not so direct. If you have this term equal to zero, so if there is no motion, and if you have no externally applied forces, this equation reduces to grad P equal zero. So you have no variation of pressure. Pressure is constant in space. Okay? But it is well known that the pressure inside a drop of water is higher than the pressure outside in the vapor. 
So you cannot apply, you cannot apply continuum theory for this at least three-dimensional continuum theory for uh, solving this problem. Laplace introduced a bidimensional continuum around the drop which was exerting as a membrane the extra force needed for keeping the drop with higher pressure with respect to the outer vapor. Uh, this point of view is not so bad and it was very fruitful in many, in many aspects. However, this was my PhD thesis, if you think about this model, you find a lot of difficulties. Because if you have a material particle of a liquid, this poor material particle, in order to become vapor, must shrink to become interfacial material particle and then must expand once more to become vapor. Because this bidimensional membrane imagined by, imagined by Laplace is not constituted always by the same material particles. So if you have a, a drop which is evaporating, then the material particles constituting the drop become vapor and they are obliged to pass through this damped interface. We are introducing, and this interface has been modeled as a membrane, so as something having no thickness but mass energy and being able to exert stress. This is a very serious difficulty. The model I want to present you is the model second gradient continua which has been introduced by Piola, developed by many others, including uh, Midlin, um, Tupin, Germain. It has to be understood uh, what happened between Piola and these people. However, some not completely self-consistent from the mathematical point of view equations were introduced by Korteweg in the effort of describing the equilibrium of drops with vapor. However, in, Con in Korteweg the terms are added with some ad hoc assumptions and they were violently criticized before being studied. Okay. So, okay, you have a formula which is going out. We start exactly as we did for first gradient materials. Instead of considering kinetic energy plus the formation energy which depends on F, we add another extra term which depends on the gradient of F. So you have chi F equal grad chi and grad F which is the second gradient of, grad chi, of chi. For this reason we can call this second gradient continuum. The calculations which we have performed before for the first two terms hold true. 
So we need to calculate simply a new, the first variation of a new action. So we need to calculate the first variation of this action. Uh, I keep this minus sign there because it is crucial in, in what follows. Of, unfortunately, this I have lost here delta grad f, okay, which is somewhere here on the right, okay. So the first variation of the integral is calculated in this way. This animal has been already calculated with the first gradient, if you remember the integration by parts. So you get this animal, divergence of x of this derivative minus this, and this extra term on the boundary. So this addend is completely similar to the one which we already treated in a previous lecture. So now we have to deal with this animal which I have written in component tensorial forms. So here I have delta F small a capital A comma B. So this is K A derived with respect to capital X A capital X B. So you have a second order derivative. For this reason we know that this animal is symmetric if you change A and B. And this is useful in what we will do. Okay. Variational principles are very beautiful because con kinematic compatibility is inbuilt in the theory. You, you don't need to verify it. It is already there, explicit. Okay. Okay. So now I propose you to perform a first integration by parts. So I have the derivative with respect to x b of this animal. You derive it. You get this animal plus this animal, which is this one, is the one which we have in this integral. Okay. So I replace in the first variation and I get these two terms, this animal here and this animal there. This animal is the divergence of something. This animal is delta f something. Okay, look at this animal here. B is saturated. Okay? So you have a double tensor with one small index A and one big index capital A. This addend here plays exactly the same role as the addend which we have already studied before, here. With a difference, instead of having this derivative there, you have the divergence of the derivative of W second with respect to the gradient of F. Okay? Look, this I can write in few pages because we have Levi Civita tensor calculus. All this has been written in Piola in 20 pages of calculations. But he did succeed in discovering the mathematical structure of this animal. This is the divergence of something 
uh, higher order tensor, after the divergence, you get an animal which is similar to the stress which we have introduced before. Okay? So this animal is not new and you can manipulate it without troubles, while this animal, unfortunately, this is new. Because you have on the boundary the integral on the surface of delta F A M. This we have not met before. So you have the gradient of the placement estimated on the boundary and you need to calculate the first variation of this. Here you will need some differential geometry for integrating by parts this animal on the surface. So this, this is what we will see uh, in the next step. But if you look here to the animal we did is exactly equal as before, I show you once more the calculations so you can express this delta F A capital A in terms of delta key A. You integrate by parts another time and you get on the boundary something. Okay? And in the bulk, the double divergence of something. So, to Euler equations, we will need to add this addend and this boundary condition. Plus this addend and this other boundary condition. But we are left with this. Okay. We need to represent this in terms of the fundamental field, the placement, chi. While there you have its gradient. So this doesn't mean by itself very much if you don't integrate by part another time. Okay, now I think I must switch to the appendix. I know that this, I am going very slowly, but I know that for you this could be very, very difficult if you are not accustomed to the notations. So what we have now? We have a surface which is the boundary of a body, a three-dimensional volume. Unfortunately, as we have seen in, in the tetrahedron argument, this boundary is not smooth. You, you cannot, in general, you cannot, you cannot declare I will limit myself to study only boundaries which are regular. Okay? For many reasons, theoretical, experimental, phenomenological. Okay? So you need to consider this boundary as constituted by regular faces, regular curves, and points. Think about the Cauchy tetrahedron we have constructed in the argument of Cauchy. Uh, this is very important because the argument of Cauchy doesn't hold as it is for second gradient materials, and, and you have to understand why. 
Okay. So if you consider the tetrahedron, you have one, the four faces which are flat, so there is no curvature with a given normal. Then you have the edges at which the normals jump. And then you have a curve which is rather regular, but three curves are concurring in one wedge. So you have, from a geometrical point of view, an animal which is rather, rather difficult to treat. However, using, I think, I couldn't find the sources, using a clever idea which most likely is originated by Lichnerowitz, a French uh, expert in differential geometry, we can treat this animal in a rather simplified way if you follow the trick. So I call embedded Riemannian manifold a surface and a curve embedded in E3, in the three-dimensional Euclidean space. I assume some regularity properties for these surfaces and curves. The regularity properties which I assume is you have a normal, you have a tangent, um, a tangent plane for the surface and a tangent line for the curve. The normal is smooth so it is varying smoothly on the surface, and the tangent vector to the curve R is, is varying smoothly. Okay. Then I assume that, let us start with the surface. I can move along the surface a little bit, along the normal of the surface, and I can construct a translated surface from the surface which I have at the beginning. This second surface is, if the translation epsilon amount of translation epsilon is smooth enough, also this second surface is smooth. So the curvature radius is bigger than epsilon everywhere. I believed that I could talk about the curve more easily because the tradition in the Italian school of engineering is that the Frenet triedron is studied. The Frenet triedron is a triedron which is constituted by the tangent vector to the curve, the vector pointing towards the center of the tangent circle to the curve and the normal to the plane constituted by these two vectors. So I assume that the Frenet triedron along a curve is varying smoothly so that I can translate along the two normal direction orthogonal to the tangent vector to the curve, I can translate epsilon, this curve, still getting another regular curve. Why I need this, this trick? Because I need to introduce the projector operator P and the projector operator Q on the surface and on the curve, this is very easy. Why? Because you take a vector, you project it in the tangent plane, and you get P of this vector. So capital P of a vector is its tangent projection 
on the tangent plane of the surface. Q of this vector is its projection, projection in the normal direction of the surface. The discussion I needed to tell you before is to persuade you that this field P, which is a tensor field, can be prolongated in a neighborhood of the surface or in a neighborhood of the curve without difficulty. Because you translate a little bit the surface, you consider the projection on the normal and tangent spaces, and you get the field P in a whole open set, including your surface or including your curve. When I studied physics second year, in particular when I studied electromagnetism and Maxwell equations, this trick was used in order to deduce the uh, differential form of many integral laws. For instance, when you formulate Ampere law, you have lines in which you have currents, electric currents, and on these lines you have forces per unit line. In order to avoid problems, the standard version of Maxwell theory includes some thickening of surfaces, some transformation of curves into tubes in such a way that you can apply three-dimensional Gauss theorem. Okay? So, this trick, my most ancient source after Levi Civita, Levi Civita is not using this trick. This trick appears for sure in Paris in the late 70s, in the book of in the book signed, authored by Lichnerowitz. Okay, why this trick is so powerful? Because you can represent the projection not only in the system of coordinates adapted to the surface or to the curve as done by Frenet or Gauss. Okay, you can represent these projections, these projectors, in a external, always the same fixed basis for display for the space of displacements in the Euclidean space. So I have here introduced the components I J for meaning. Vij applied to Vi means the component Vj of the projector, the projected vector V in the tangent plane. Okay, so this is a standard uh, tensor representation of the projector which geometrically is easily understandable for you. I think that this trick is due to the fact that the tradition of teaching mathematics wants that everybody is accustomed to Euclidean geometry. So if you manage to reproduce in your uh, discussion some mathematical objects living in the Euclidean three-dimensional space, everybody believes he is understanding. It's only a question of belief, 
because inside the three-dimensional Euclidean space there are very difficult things happening, like Mo Mebius strip, for instance. Okay, so the regularity assumptions I'm telling to you are limiting the class of surfaces which we are considering, however they are enough for developing the theory. What happens if I sum the projection P plus the projection Q? I get the identity, so the delta, Kronegger's delta. If I apply two times the projection, I get the projection, because if I project something which is already in the tangent plane, it, its projection is itself. Similarly, if I apply two times Q, I get Q. What happens if I apply Q and then P? I got zero, the vanishing application. Why? Because I take a vector. I project it orthogonal to a surface, and then I project what is resulting, that is a normal vector, I project it in the tangent plane, and I get zero. Okay? Okay. Now, I know that you are a little bit, uh, you know, uh, I read for you Gramsci for this. Understanding is painful. And I hated preparing this lecture because I could not prove the calculations I will show you, which are contained in three pages, for six months. And only because Professor Casciola wanted them, I ended in I didn't give up with the help of a Russian colleague and younger people, okay? So, understanding something is painful, but this is our job. Otherwise, you decide to behave like the engineers who are doing practice, practical work, very important. They have learned once forever a given amount of theories and they apply them, period. The whole life is dedicated to the application of what they have already learned. There is nothing bad in this. But you will never be able to solve new problems. That is, problems which are not included in the set of theories you were given when you studied at the university. Old professors in engineering schools were very strict in warning students never to use something in not the appropriate way or context. If you apply Euler equations for the um, phenomena of uh, buoyancy of a wing, you are lost because you cannot describe this phenomenon. Okay. So, now you are ready and I give you this an as an exercise, you are ready to prove, starting from Gauss divergence theorem in three dimensions, you are now ready to prove the divergence theorem in a surface or a curve. Look how elegant is this formalism when M is a surface you get the divergence theorem on a surface. When M is a curve, you get the divergence theorem on a curve. Only one formula is good for two. Which is the trick? You consider 
the field WJ, okay? This one, which is a field defined on your surface or curve. Then, exactly as you have prolonged the projector operator, you are allowed to prolong the vector W, the vector field W, constant along the normal. By the way, if you ever studied the theory of plates and shells, then you have seen this done many times. Okay. So when you calculate the derivative of this prolongation field with respect to the normal component, you get zero. So I propose you to write the three-dimensional version of divergence theorem to impose that all derivative with respect to the normal directions is zero and you get as a final result this animal. This is the definition of surface divergence. So you have to calculate this field after having prolonged it, you can calculate the derivatives with respect to three directions, not only the two which are tangent, but also the third orthogonal. Then you apply the projector to the comma, so to the derivative, and you get what is called the surface divergence which you have studied in electromagnetism, in electromagnetism, for sure. The integral of the di surface divergence is the flux of the field through the boundary. What is the boundary of a surface? It is a curve. And this curve has one normal in the tangent plane of the surface, which I have called nu. So if you remember those drawings which you read, you see in the physics second year books, you have this cupola through which you are estimating the flux of a, an electric field, then you have the border and you have the law, the law that the derivative with respect to time of the flux of magnetic field is equal to the circulation of the electric field on the, on the boundary. When you prove these theorems, these consequences of Maxwell laws, you need to apply this divergence theorem and the outer normal to the tangent plane to the curve is this new. Uh, okay, of course the field W was assumed to be tangent. I wanted to write here the version of the previous divergence theorem because I worked on this nearly one year for my PhD thesis because this is the source of Laplace law. If you apply this theorem on the membrane around a drop, you get a term here which depends on the curvature of your surface because when you derive the projector vector P you get so-called curvature goes curvature operator on the surface. Of course, if you derive the normal along a surface, you get something which is va in the ambient space you have a, an arrow which is varying in time. 
and this is included in the term P K I comma K. Okay, so simply adding the projector operator inside and outside, you get the generalized uh, divergence theorem for surfaces and curves. Okay, so we set this slowly. We already needed it. When you have flux of something, you want to transform it into integral in the volume of something else, you apply the volumic divergence. If you have a line integral on the border of a surface, you want to transform this line integral into a surface integral. This formula 51 gives you this possibility. So it is the exact parallel of uh, the other theorem with, with which we are accustomed. Okay, so here we said that this we call stress, surface stress, first gradient surface stress, because everything which is multiplied times the gradient of displacement is a stress. Okay? So we apply the divergence theorem as we did before. Splitting. The trick is this one. You split the derivative with respect to capital A, adding a delta, and considering this delta as the sum of the two projectors. So you have here a new term in which you have only the normal derivatives of the displacement key. This animal cannot be simplified. Okay? Here you have a term in which I am indicating in the wrong side. This is the normal. Okay? Normal Q is the normal. And this is the new term. Uh, I mean, the term which we need to integrate by parts. Okay. I want to tell you uh, this. Now on, we will assume that the normal derivative of the gradient of key is arbitrary. So its coefficient has to vanish. This is the standard trick of the integration by parts. When we integrated by part, we did it several times. At the end of the in, uh, integration procedure, we got sounding times delta key. We said integral of sounding times delta key equals zero for every delta key implies that the coefficient of delta key must vanish. And we have found the bulk equation. Okay, we need a number of variations delta key rich enough for isolating every point in the bulk. Okay, now what uh, I think it was not so clear for Lagrange and Piola and I do not know when exactly became clear to people, but for sure Midlin understood it, okay, is that you can invent a test function on the boundary of your body, which is very small in value, having a finite normal derivative. So you can sample this boundary condition 
without sampling anything else. Okay. This is very crucial in the formulation of the boundary value problems uh, in numeric, when you develop numerical methods. You need to know which test functions you have in your hands. Okay, so this term is a very important new term which needs to be interpreted physically. Germain calls it double force. We will try to understand it now. This animal, this animal here, we have to integrate by part again. Okay. Here I'm simply rewriting the previous f formula and in this way maybe it is more suggestive. What I told you is that this normal derivative is arbitrary. So everything multiplying this normal derivative summed up must vanish. Okay. This is another external action which your second gradient material can sustain. If in the external power you add integral of something, external action times these, you get a non-vanishing boundary condition for this from this derivative saturated two times with the normal. In capillary fluids, this has been interpreted as a property of the surface, which we can call vectability. So the, capac the capacity of attracting or repelling the uh, fluid particles by this surface at a microscopic level. So actually, this integration by parts produces for us a new boundary condition and a new set of external actions which can be balanced, which can be sustained by our uh, body, our model of body. Okay? So, paralleling the observation of Piola, we can say that second gradient continua can sustain external surface double forces, which are external actions expanding work on virtual normal gradient of displacement fields. Now, you could ask, what, which is the physical meaning of this? Couples are a particular kind of double forces. But also dilatancy are particular. Imagine to have a porous medium with holes. And you are on the boundary of this porous medium. You can go inside the pore and you can dilate the pore from inside. The resultant action is zero. The force as resultant equals zero. Also the moment of this internal pressure of the pore is zero. However, you are acting on your body, dilating one of his external pores. And this is causing the formation inside your body. Do you ever add the name of this joint pressure? We, I should check if it is the same idea. I, I, I have to check. Maybe you can give me yeah, okay, can uh, reference. Yeah, this is very important because you discover that many people are thinking about these ideas, but 
the straight jacket of Cauchy doesn't allow them to tell too loudly. Okay. Ah, by the way, Cossera book was ignored for 50 years, even if it was translated in English. And it was a choice of, uh, I think, Kelvin who wanted to translate it in English. So it was accepted in the physics environment, not in the mechanical or engineering environment. Everybody in the engineering environment is victim of the Cauchy straight jacket. They, they cannot get out. So this animal, they ask me what it means. It is not a pressure, it is not a force, therefore it is not existing. Of course, you can always zoom, increasing the resolution of your model and reach a level of resolution where only forces are applied. I don't know, maybe, maybe. But in general, when you have chosen your length scale, you are prisoner of your phenomena and you could be obliged to add this boundary. Uh, by the way, um, De Gen and Kahn Hilliard are using second gradient fluids since 1940. Okay. However, not in a mathematically consistent way. Sometimes they miss a term because they are not deriving everything from uh, an action. So they miss a consistency. Some, somewhere. So, this animal can be added and a similar term, yeah, this is another external action which has an energy, if it is conservative, related to the normal derivative of key. Okay. Now, I want to go ahead in the integration by parts, okay? Because you will discover that the straight jacket of Cauchy is very tight. Cauchy does not allow you any contact force per unit line. So, for instance, you are a practical engineer and you have concrete, reinforced concrete. You would like to say my reinforcement bar is small, has a diameter, small compared with the pillar I am designing. It could be. In Cauchy theorem, theory, you are not allowed to consider the force per unit line exerted by the reinforcement bar onto the concrete part of the pillar. Indeed, practical engineers are obliged to consider thick cylindrical bars whose radius they must know for designing reinforced concrete. They must use always a three-dimensional model. Otherwise, they cannot go ahead. Okay, I, won't, I, I didn't try up to now to use this for reinforced concrete. Maybe we could do it. Take this term you, are, you have got on, on the surface and then with a lot of patience, what you do? You derive this. The trick is always the same. Derivative of a product. This derivative is the derivative of these times these not derived, which is here, minus delta ki times the derivative of what is left. Then you apply, then you apply divergence theorem here 
and you get edge forces because you have something which is working on displacement a force so look the energy of second gradient derived with respect to the gradient of F saturated with the normal N of two faces. So you have N plus and then minus. So these symbols, this symbol which comes from Poincaré is the curve with two sides, the sides plus and the side minus, with two different tangent vectors, one, one direction or the other. This again you have seen many times in the books of electromagnetism. Okay, the, bounder, the boundaries which summed become zero because they are uh, oriented in two different directions. So here you have an expression, then you have to project it on the outer normal tangent to the two surfaces and you get a, a, an animal which is the version in second gradient theory <coughs> of Cauchy representation theorem. Cauchy representation theorem tells you the force per unit area if you know Cauchy stress. What you do? You saturate Cauchy stress times the normal of the Cauchy cut you get a force per unit area. Here, what you have to do? You take this tensor, you saturate with N, then you saturate with P, M, nu, P, okay? What you get? A vector. What is this? The contact vector per unit line. So this is the force which appears on an edge when you operate a Cauchy cut. So this animal should appear in the Cauchy tetrahedron on the edges. Luckily for you, we have not, we should not, we must not integrate by parts once more to reach the wedges because you already reached delta chi. If you have the, the, the surface other element, you should, should not be there on the right. Yeah, you are right. This is wrong. Oh my god. Thanks. I, at least you are not only obliging me to make calculations, but correcting <laughs> them a little bit. Yes, this is the line, of course. Okay. Okay, but we are left behind. So, once more, I can repeat. Second gradient continua can sustain external line forces, external actions, expanding work on virtual displacement fields on the edges of the boundary. Now, this animal is inside the straight jacket of Cauchy. Okay? And indeed, there are authors who try to introduce edge forces, contact forces. But as they are not using a variational principle, they do not have the physical intuition to introduce double force. Okay? Now, not being modest enough, I tell you that in 1995 I wrote a paper with Pierre Seppescher in which I proved that if you have edge forces, you must have double forces. 
and I characterized the family of second gradient continua having double forces without edge forces. So you can have a continuum with double forces without double forces, but you cannot have edges, edges forces. Edges forces. Uh, you are but you can you can have double forces without edge forces things but you cannot have edge forces without double forces okay so there are nearly 50 papers in the literature doing a mess about this while a trivial integration by parts available in uh, germans and Midlin papers was uh, very easy to do. So my, my contribution was to prove that you cannot have uh, edge force without double. Okay, and to reprove the Cauchy tetrahedron argument modified for second grade materials because I was so naive to believe that the problem was this one. I believed. I proved. Cauchy tetrahedron argument, and people will stop complaining. They, they, they continued to complain. So this, the point of view, the variational point of view, which has to be accepted. But what is now very interesting is that the story is not yet ended. We have one last term, which is very important. In this term, you have a force per unit area. So again, a mistake here. Okay. So you have a force per unit area, which look how you can construct it. You have this constitutive quantity saturated with the normal saturated with the projection, then you calculate the divergence of this. So you calculate the derivative of the normal. You calculate the derivative of the projector. In formulas you could write this in compact formulas. So what you have? You have a force per unit area depending on the curvature of Cauchy cut. When you announce this in a conference 150 years after Piola, 50 years after, after Germain, one half of the audience start mumbling. The idea that contact actions must be depend only on the normal is so deeply printed in the head of people that they refuse to abandon it. So they, they do not want to accept even the assumption, mathematical, you say, okay, let us assume there is an energy depending on higher gradient, I integrate by parts and I get this mathematically. Okay, they refuse, they say the calculation is wrong. So, I believe that this phenomenon has to be studied scientifically. It is like in politics, like in trends. Why women of my generation used a kind of pants and a kind of shoes? And the woman of another generation use another kind of shoes and another kind of pants. So I, I believe that science was trend and fashion free. Also, I believe it was propaganda-free. Actually, 
because she was very, very powerful. He managed to propagate his ideas and his point of view everywhere using a very powerful propaganda machine. This is for sure a good uh, propelling force. Okay, but Laplace was studying drops in the same moment in which Cauchy was imposing his straight jacket and instead of changing the uh, continuum theory, he added a, a membrane. It was easier to add a more complicated mathematical model than fighting against Cauchy. This is my interpretation. Of course, is biased. But I want to say that the trends are very strong in this in this context. So and this I managed to do also last three years ago when I did the first version of this lectures for the doctoral school. So to Cauchy equations you need to add these in the bulk. On the boundary you need to add this term which is Cauchy-like up to here, but this term which is not anymore Cauchy-like and then you need to add extra, okay, extra, here I'm missing equal to zero, okay? So we have a theory, ah, by the way, Piola claims that this was too simple, it's very amusing. At the end of the derivation of some equations valid for nth gradient theory, because the boundary conditions likely Piola left to us to calculate the expression, but the bulk equations, this one, Piola proved that you have an iterative structure. For third gradient, you have plus div 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 dw over d grad second then for fourth gradient you have with alternate signs four divergence for nth gradient you have minus one to the n div 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 n times so this part of the job he did and he writes that against French geometer who claim the same, it could be necessary to use these terms. He, say, he, he writes in, in a very elegant Italian, whatever they will say, I don't believe that insensible causes cannot have sensible effects. So, talking about the sh very short range interaction in a continuum. Okay. Okay. Now we have a painful which we skip. If we want to develop the, the WS. This one. This one. Is this a property of the surface? This is the property of the external world. The external world is acting on your continuum, having a potential which depends on displacement of the surface and normal gradient of displacement of the contact surface, which is admissible. Okay? So that would be actually the weather field, right? The par yeah, here this is much more general. In the case of capillary fluid in presence of a wettable surface, yes, this will be wettability. Exactly. 
Okay, so you believe me that objectivity implies the dependence on C and grad C. Okay, it is remarkable that Piola, <laughs> I don't know how these people could do this, did the calculations up to the third term in a given series, proving that the energy must depend only on the gradient of C. So he had a mess grad F and he could impose the invariance under change of observer and verify it doing a lot of calculations. The calculations done in modern times for proving this are rather easy. We skip this, okay? And we go to capillary fluids. Likely the formula is inside, okay? So we start with a fluid whose deformation energy depends not only on rho, as in Euler fluid, but also on the Eulerian gradient of rho. Uh, it is an open field to understand if it is meaningful and which is the meaning of an energy in which you have the Lagrangian gradient of rho in the energy. Okay, this could be subject of some investigation. Okay, so you start with the integral in the Eulerian volume, you change the variables, and you need to add the determinant of the change of variable, which is this j. Okay? Maybe we should call it H following the Piola, but I mean, in, in the equations of, of Piola there is this H, okay. So we need to calculate the first variation of this energy. Okay, so maybe now we are tired and close to the end of the lecture, but I propose you to read it quickly. Then we will go back to the to see the forest instead of seeing each tree for the moment. Okay? So I, I missed the cover lecture. What do you mean by the symbol B with the arrow? The row? No, this is the Ah, you have missed only one lecture. This is, you have, a row is what? An Eulerian field. Okay, understood it was. So you compose it with the chi minus, minus one to get a Lagrangian one. Okay, but why you put the arrow? For meaning that you are, I don't use the composition symbol which is clumsy. The arrow means transport. Oh. You transport it from Eulerian to, to Lagrangian configuration. Okay, these calculations, I painfully involved in these calculations all the coders of this paper. I, I want to show you this. But at the end of the story, you consider the Piola stress, so what we are doing. We have this equation. This addends to the bulk equations. These are written in Eulerian configuration, okay? 
and this could be very useful in solving the vibration of a capillary drop, I think. Then you need to transport these equations in the Eulerian configuration. And this is done using the Piola transform. But now you are not only calculating one divergence, you are calculating two divergences. So you have to, uh, to calculate the double divergence Piola transport. So this is the technical difficulty which has to be solved and which was not solved before. So this should give you an interesting information. Being obliged to prepare some lectures for this doctoral school. Having in the audience somebody interested in capillary fluid, in particular Professor Casciola, but also some of his co-workers. Somebody asked me, how do you derive with your variational methods the famous Canilliard equations? I went in the books and I couldn't find anything except two lines in a paper with, with a result which is wrong, by the way. The only correct result was not acceptable in my philosophical point of view. Because Pierre Sepecher proved the Eulerian counterparts of this equation 44 for capillary fluids using a trick. He used the principle of virtual powers in the Eulerian form and he added to this the conservation of energy. So he was not deriving everything from least action. He needed to postulate extra conservation of mechanical energy with some calculations which are not simpler than those which I will show you in the next lecture. So the difficulty we are now facing is the following. I have a principle of least action. I have written the equation in Lagrangian form and I would like to transform them in the Eulerian form. Okay. Now I need to transform every Piola tensor. Now we have two Piola tensors. This one and this one, we have to transform it into Lagrangian, Eulerian form to get the Eulerian balance of force. So the generalization of Euler equations. Okay? So I jump to the end. We will go into the details. At least Professor Casciola asked to follow them because he wanted to know them. Okay. In the Eulerian description, we have this stress. So we have pick up. Is, is a pressure capillary. Of course, you have, I'm not writing, but you have also the Euler pressure at the bottom. The pickup is defined somewhere here. So this pickup, you recognize, is a friend of us. It's the standard W minus rho derivative of W respect to rho, which 
occurs in classical thermodynamics. So you have this pressure, then you have the divergence of W cap over D beta, beta is the grad rho square, so this animal will produce at the end the gradient of Laplacian in the particular case of um, canilliard fluids. And you have, look here, you have a shear stress which depends on the gradient of rho. So in presence of gradient of rho, you have a shear stress, which is grad rho tensor grad rho. Now, I wanted to play a game. It is not applicable anymore in the standard meaning. But I could prove a Bernoulli law for capillary fluids. Playing with that formula and playing in the standard way with the balance of force and with some calculations, at the end you get this effective pressure. So, in the Euler, in the Bernoulli law, you have the standard kinetic energy which comes from there, you have the standard gradient of pressure, if you want to adhere, there is plus minus, if you want to adhere, you have bulk force, but you have another gradient. Actually, it is not a divergence. With the calculations I do, I prove it becomes a gradient. But, but inside you have density, gradient of density, second gradient of density. But that what you call the effective is it, not what they call chemical potential. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Because in the potentials you have only grad rho, not grad grad, not the second gradient of rho. I mean, if you take the, the every potential I've seen in capillary fluid, you have only gradients of rho inside. Only gradient. So I'm, I'm not so sure. Of course, this law is useless because you, you need to know grad rho and second gradient of rho along stream lines. So it is, I mean, I don't see an immediate use of this, but it could be useful. Could be useful. No, more. More than that. More than that. I mean, the, the single, single time rings. Yeah. The I mean, I cannot, the, you know, the, the expression is written somewhere, I can show you, but here is the expression. And look, inside here you have all mixed derivatives of rho. You have the divergence of something in which you have grad rho. So I, I, I don't believe it is possible to do something. I don't know, we, we, we should check. I have to check the structure of the formulas. Okay, so I, I want to uh, conclude telling that, in my opinion, uh, the, the
very elementary information which are written in these 52 pages, uh, you already know 50%, and so you will rediscover in the new notation. Then you must, in my opinion, do the effort of understanding this formalism, which is not difficult, and which gives you a powerful tool for your future research activity. So you have to add to your tools another one. In my own opinion, this is very, very useful. Not only mine. Okay, so we stop.